Good morning. Good morning and welcome to Crosspoint. My name is Lindsay Klein. I am so excited that you decided to spend a portion of your Sunday with us. If you're a first time guest, we're especially excited to see you and we would like to get to know a little bit more about you. So if you would before service ends or after service ends, don't run out before service ends, please stop by the welcome table. Uh, we would love to have an opportunity to answer any questions that you might have about Crosspoint and get to know you as well. If you're joining us online, hello, we're excited to see you too. We have moderators who are waiting um, to speak with you, pray with you, um, you can ask questions. Uh, so just give us a shout out and let us know that you're there. So our mission at Crosspoint is to um, lead others to be passionate followers of Christ. And one of the ways that we do that is through Kid XP and Student XP. And we've had this amazing new opportunity to host Student XP at the YMCA. And that is on Wednesday nights. So if you have a middle schooler or a high schooler who would like to join us, we would love to have you. Middle school starts at 6.30 and high school starts at 7. And that's on Wednesdays. So please join us. So Kings Island Halloween Hot is this Saturday for our student XP. So if you have a teen who's interested in going to that, make sure that they sign up at either on the app or at the table or online. Um, the deadline for that is Thursday, so please make sure that they're signing up for that. So mark your calendars. October 22nd will be the YMCA Trunk or Treat, and this year we're partnering with them for that event. And we really, really need people to participate, so if you would like to bring your vehicle, decorate your vehicle, hand out can candy for the little ones, we would love that opportunity to um, just have some fun with the youth in our community. So if you're interested in doing that, you can sign up at the welcome table as well. If you're not able to join, because we understand it's on a Tuesday, they also need s'mores supplies. So if you're interested in picking up some marshmallows, graham crackers, Hershey bars for me or for the event, <laughs> make sure you sign up at the welcome table for that as well. So this, uh, today we're continuing the series Out of the Boat. Tammy Conrad will be bringing the message today on discerning God's call. And we're continuing to fill the um, boat out in our lobby. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's practically overflowing now. And that's a good problem to have. And we have two more weeks to fill that boat. So if you would, please make sure next Sunday or anytime you want to stop by and bring in those blessing box donations, we would love to have those for our community. So if you wouldn't mind now, if you would stand up and greet somebody around you and please continue to stand as we worship. Good morning, everyone. We're so glad you're with us this morning. We invite you to continue standing in worship with us today.
us with this one.
sacrifice that, that what you what you did when you sacrificed yourself for us, Father, it changed the course of history. Father, it changed everything. We don't have to be lost in our sin anymore. We don't have to be wandering just in darkness without you, Father. As we come to you, we can meet you, and you meet us where we are, Father. acceptance, Father, as we are, not, not as we need to change or as we need to do this, this, and this to, to finally be worthy of you, Father, because we can't do that ourselves, Father, but you on the cross did that for us. And that's why you speak over us something better, better than we could ever claim over ourselves, better than anyone else could claim over us, Father. You speak truth and life into each one of us. How's everybody doing? Good. Um, great fall break, right? Did you guys have good weather here? I was in Atlanta. It was really hot. But, um, but I have to tell you that um, we, I know I'm going to get booed. I hate to start off getting booed, but we are really big Cardinals fans. And I know, but we were in Atlanta when they were playing the Braves. And so we like, oh, we got to go to this baseball game, right? So we went, and the first thing they did, like, thanks for not booing me for the first thing. Thank you. I really do appreciate that. I know that, that you guys had to hold yourselves back from that. But um, one of the first things they did is they, they said, hey, as we get started, everybody stand up and, and, and tell everybody hi. I'm like, what? It's not just church. <laughs> so for those, those of you that hate that section, don't go to a Braves game. Don't do it. So anyway, it was, it was fun, but that had nothing to do with what we're talking about today. But if anybody knows me, you know that I struggle making decisions. Like, and even once I've made it, I second guess what I've made. So like, like when, when, you know, date night, date night's miserable. We start on a horrible note. Where do you want to go? I don't care. I nothing really. Where do you want to go? Well, I don't know. You just choose. Where do you want to go? I'm like, I, I, I really, nothing stands out. So, I mean, I don't really feel like chicken. I don't know this. I don't, well, let's go to Mexican. And then we're on the way to Mexican and it's like, oh, that, 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 I think I'll eat Mexican all night long. I, I don't know that I should do that. And so then, so then it's like, should we just do Subway or Little Caesars? It's right there. So, I mean, even like, it takes me forever to decide which way to go to Kroger as I'm coming up the old hill. Like, crazy, I know. But like, oh, they put those two stoplights in on me. Believe it'll take forever, but it's the double-A light. Oh, I don't know. Like, and then I second guess, and if you've seen me, you might see me do this in the car. Sorry, because I'm like, oh, no, then I'll cut through the light. Then it'll be better to go the double-A light. So it's frustrating. So I, I, I said, Paul, I said, I just need, I need an opening story. So Paul's my husband, for those of you that don't know that. And I said, Paul, I need an opening story. What, can you just, uh, you know, tell me one time that, um, that I struggled making a decision. And he said, how do I choose? So, so it's apparently it's a family problem. No, he realized difficulty. It's just, there are so many. But I've realized that there's two types of people, and most of us fall on this spectrum. And when we're talking about getting on the, off, out of the boat, it can really comes down to these two personality types, two types of people. And the first one, when they're taught, when Jesus says, get out of the boat, they're like, oh, I wonder what the temperature of the water is. Oh, those waves might be too high. Wind speed. Um, 
okay, how far is it from the boat to the water? How can I judge that? How can I manage that? And you know what I'm talking about. You have to look at all of the variables, figure out a way to overcome all of the variables before you'll step out. And then even when you step out, you're holding the boat like this. Yeah, yeah, it's still pretty, pretty cold, yeah. You, you know who you are, right? Okay, so that's the first type of person. The second type of person are those that just jump. Well, that sounds exciting. Let's jump out of this boat. Let's jump out of this boat. You people know who you are. You make the rest of us crazy. You know which one I am. So anyway, but they don't take the time to actually see or think or, 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 or manage anything. You may, may even be married to one of these people. And just, just take a minute. Just, just take a minute for me to catch up. Because they just jump at whatever. This seems like a great opportunity. Let's just do it. Let's just see what happens. What a great adventure. Oh, my goodness. We find ourselves on one of those two spectrums. And you may be somewhere in the middle. You love the great adventure, but you do want to evaluate the, the process. Or you don't care. Let's just do it. Here's the problem. Both of us are wrong. <laughs> Both of us have to navigate that because if the enemy can't keep us in the boat by questioning our call or worrying about the storm, then he will convince us to jump out of a boat all on our own and do what God has not been calling us to do. And it distracts us. Either one distracts us from the call of God. So how do we manage this? We know we're one of these two types. How do we get the courage to jump out of the boat? And how do we say, whoa, 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 so, 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 uh, so God, what, what do I need to do? And I think Peter gives us an incredible example in the story. So if you haven't been up, up to date, let me just kind of catch you up quickly on the story. And we are in Matthew 14. And um, so what happens is Jesus has just um, served 5,000 people with five loaves, and two, um, five loaves of bread and two fish. Okay, so they're kind of on a spiritual high right now. Like, that's kind of incredible. And Jesus said... Disciples, I want you to go on and get in the boat. I'm going to go off to pray, and I'll catch up with you. Now, as a disciple, I, I, I mean, these people are human, right? As a disciple, I'd be like, how is he going to catch up with us? Like, like he's on foot? There's no Ubers. Like, I, 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 we're going to go meet you on the other side? I, we, like, I, didn't that even enter their mind? Like, sure, you'll catch up with us. You know, whatever. So anyway, they did it. They got on. About In the middle of the night, a storm came up, a lot of wind, and it was pushing the boat back, so they had to work really hard just to keep the ground that they were on. And it says that Jesus came to them in the fourth watch of the night. And so it's, it's getting pretty late in the night, early morning. They've been fighting these waves for a while. They're tired, and um, there's a lot going on, and Jesus appears. Now, if you're Jesus... You're walking on the water. I'm pretty sure this isn't how they thought he would meet up with them. Like, right? They, well, you know that because they were like, oh, it's a ghost. You know, I, I don't, I mean, they were tired. Let's just give them that, okay? So anyway, so Jesus comes up and uh, he's, don't you think he's going, now, now which one? W which one do you think is going to like see me first, respond to me? Like, um, what's, what's going to, how's this going to play out? He's like, I mean, it could be John. John could recognize me. I mean, we're really tight, right? I mean, John and me, like this. Because I'm pretty sure it's not going to be Thomas. Good night. That man questions everything I do and say, right? Or, uh, or what if it's Matthew? Oh, Matthew. Oh, no, there he is. Matthew, he's, he's doing the sales. He's pulling up. He's doing all this stuff. I think Matthew might be a little OCD, but I guess it makes sense with it being a tax collector and all. And I was like, oh, there's Peter. There's Peter. Yep, Peter sees me. Hey, hey, Peter. Yeah. And he said, Peter recognizes him. And I just, I just have to think, because Peter's that type two person. You're like, let's jump out of the boat. I mean, we see it. He thinks, he speaks before he thinks. He does before he thinks. And, and he just is kind of a mess. I think we're just all glad he didn't do one of those whole Forrest Gump jumps out of the boat, you know? But he didn't. Peter did something different. So here I am. I'm in Matthew 14. And I'm starting with verse 27. And it says this. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. So he acknowledges who he is here. And Peter replied, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Lord, if it's you. For once in Peter's life, he didn't just act. He said, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come out on the water. Come, he said. I love that. Now, here are a couple of things that I want to I bring to mind about Peter. First of all, Peter recognized Jesus. 
He wasn't so consumed by the storm, so consumed by the work, so consumed by the chaos that he wasn't able to see Jesus. He was able to look beyond the storm to where Jesus was calling. I think that's huge. What storm are we in? Are you in? Can you see Jesus? I know he's there. What storm is distracting you so much? Because Peter seems to be the only one that responds to Jesus. The other 11 are just sitting dealing with the storm. And Peter said, this storm isn't, isn't going to be more than I know who you are, Jesus. And so that, that's incredible. So that's the first thing, is that Peter was able to see and recognize Jesus in the storm. Peter also recognized Jesus' voice. He said, God, Lord, is that you? Because he knew Jesus' voice. He'd put the time in. He'd walked with him. He'd talked with him. He knew. They were friends. Jesus knew him. He knew Jesus. And so he was able to recognize his voice. I think that's huge. Some people say that, that Peter threw out a test. Well, Jesus, if it's you, then call me out on the water. You know, kind of like, Lord, if you get me through this day, <laughs> you know, I'll... Uh, I'll pray with you tonight or, you know, whatever. The deal you make, the test that you throw out. Well, Lord, if this is you, then it will rain today. Ta-da! Um, but we throw out those tests, but that's not what it was. Peter's heart wasn't there. Peter's like, Lord, it's you. Because if you're out on that water, if that's where our next ministry is, if that's the next thing we need to be doing, count me in. I'm in. I don't care about the risk. I don't care about what temperature the water is because I'm going to be above it. I know that you can do anything and everything that you're calling me to do. So Lord, is it you? Lord, is it you? And, Peter, and Jesus said, yes. Yes, Peter, it's me. Come. Because Peter took that time to figure it out. Is this what you're calling me to do? To walk on this water with you. Then Peter got down out of the boat, verse 29. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. Can you imagine that? That's, that's incredible to me. Now, later in Peter's life, he figured some more things out. Because, I mean, they went through the whole resurrection and the, and the Holy Spirit, and, and all of this empowered Peter to do missionary work. And he was an incredible voice of God throughout the New Testament in, in Acts. And, and he's writing his book here in 1 Peter. And Peter's figured some things out. And here's what he says. How do we determine what God's call is then? Right? Like, this is, this is Peter's question. It's, it's all of our question. Like, so it's, it's easy to know that when Jesus is right there, come. Come. Yeah, it's me, come. But how do we figure that out? How do we discern what the voice of God is and what the voice of God is telling us to do? And so that's why Peter tried to make it clear. And here we are in 1 Peter. And I am going to start in verse 25, but then we're going to kind of jump back up. But in verse 25, he said this. This is what makes the difference, people. This, this is the discernment that we need to have. He says this. All people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. So here's what we need to know. What we do, what we try to do, it withers like the grass in the field. So that the, the things that we strive for, the, the decisions that we make, they wither and die. But the word of the Lord endures forever. Whatever God is calling me to do is going to last for eternity. So that's why I need to know the difference. Because what I do, I want it to matter. I want what I do, what God calls me to do, to matter for eternity. Because it's easy to do what I want to do. It is. But what I want to do is to follow God so it lasts for eternity. So how do we do this? Peter tells us in verse 22. And he gives us step-by-step -step instructions. And he said in 22, now that you have purified yourselves. I'll read the whole verse and then we'll go back and take it apart. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other. Love one another deeply from the heart. So these are the guidelines that, that, um, that God has set down. Peter is documenting that for us. And he says this, purify yourselves. 
So that's the first guideline. I have to purify myself. Now, um, purity. Let's just have a little talk on that. And some of you may be saying now, now, Tammy, I know we're talking about getting out of the boat, but that ship has sailed. <laughs> and I think it's because of our, what our view of purity is. Because we think the purity is what we do and how clean we live our lives. Um, in the dictionary, it is described as, purity is described as the freedom from anything that debases, contaminates, or pollutes. Well, we all live in this world. Anything that debases, contaminates, or pollutes. So we think that purity is based on what we've done. But God has a different definition of purity. Because purity is not even possible without God. And I think the best way that I've heard this described is that, that this is a difference between the conscience and the unconscious or the subconscious. Okay? Now, the conscience is the things that we decide to do. Like, I am going to church today. I am going to do this. I am going to do that. And those are the decisions we make. And we think that these are the things that we need to change. But the subconscious is way more powerful. And this is where purity lies. Because this is what we give over to God. This is, God, I want my life to change. I'm going to surrender this over to you. And I'm going to give this to you. I'm going to give, I'm going to give my anger to you. I'm going to give my control over to you. I'm going to continually surrender so I can look more like you. I want to know more of you. And that's where purity lies. Because our subconscious controls our conscience, our decisions. Okay? Somebody tells me, don't eat the cookie. What do I want to do? Definitely eat the cookie. That's all I can think about. Eat the cookie. Eat the cookie. Don't eat the cookie. I'm not supposed to eat the cookie, but the cookie is right there. I'm going to eat the cookie. I can't control my conscience because my subconscious controls that. So I say, God, help me with my eating decisions. I turn this over to you. I surrender this over to you. And then my desire for the cookie goes away. So many times we try to just deal with the conscience and the decisions we're making where we need to get to the root of the problem and God, I need to surrender this over to you. I need to surrender this part of my life over to you. So purity is really a constant surrender over to God. It's an inner openness to allow God to reach all parts of us and to cleanse us of the contamination and the pollution of our hearts because then our decisions will look different. Our thoughts are going to look different. Everything's going to look different and it's going to be more rested in God. This is why Peter recognized God's voice because he was continually trying to surrender things over to God. He had talks with God. He had time with God, and he knew what that was. So that's the difference. Purify yourself by obeying the truth. Oh, obeying. Nobody wants to obey. That's why we took it out of the wedding vows, right? <laughs> Love, honor, and oh, heck no. I mean, seriously. Nobody wants to obey. We want to do what we want to do. We want our will. We, we feel like we know ourselves better and we want to control what that decision is that's being made. And God says, obey the truth. Obey the truth. We can only do that by purifying ourselves because then we know the truth, right? So here's the truth. You never have to ask, here's an example. You never have to ask God, do I need to jump out of the boat to forgive? Because it's a command, <laughs> right? It's a, known will of, it's a known will of God. He always wants you to do that. God will never say, his answer is always going to be yes. He is never going to say, well, you know, I guess you can stay in that boat of bitterness for a little while because you're right. They don't deserve that forgiveness at all. God's never going to say that. He commands us to forgive others. So it goes back to the purifying. Lord, give me the strength. I surrender this over to you. Give me the strength to forgive. And what my emotions don't follow, let the blood of Jesus cover. It's a known law of God. So I need to obey it. And when I begin to obey and I begin to, to purify my life and surrender things over to God, and when I begin to obey his truth, something really incredible happens. Because the one who obeys God's instructions for today will develop a keen awareness of his direction for tomorrow. Peter had probably been living his life in a sense of knowing who God was, of obeying his commands. He's still impulsive. He's still going to be doing that but he purified his heart with God. And he said, Lord, I plan on obeying your truths. And he was able to discern the voice of God. So a couple of questions. 
when you're looking for the voice of discernment. Does what I'm being called to do fit within the guidelines of who God is? Does what God calling me to do lead me into more purity of heart, mind, and action? Does what God is calling me to do lead me into more purity of heart, mind, and action? And then the verse goes on. And it says this, so that you have sincere love for one another. Now, I love that so that is so important. Can we have sincere love for one another without the first part? It doesn't seem possible. Because we have to have purify ourselves by obeying, purify ourselves, obeying the truth, so that when God has purified us so cleanly, we think like him. We love like him. Because we've done that, we have sincere love for each other because that, that is what the discerning mark is. If God is calling you to do something, it's because he has love for others and you. Love one another deeply from the heart. He says it three different times. Have sincere love for each other. Love one another deeply from the heart. This is important to him. This is really important to him. And it's so easy. Like, just love one another. How hard is that to live out sometimes? Because it's an unselfish love. And we, we were created to protect ourselves. We were created to do things that pleased us. That's how we were created. So we are fighting against our very nature. So because of that, we have to come and purify ourselves before God. We have to obey his truths, and he will teach us to love one another in the way that he can love. It also helps check our motivation. Um, here's, here's an example. There was a CEO, he was a Christian CEO, and he was asked to be the president of a prestigious college. And it was a Christian university, prestigious Christian university, and he was asked to be the president of that. And he's like, well, of course, I mean, I, does this, does what this do, following the laws of God? Yes, it does. Does it purify me in heart, mind, and action? Well, yes, it does. Does it, does it give me an opportunity to love others? Yes, it does. But here's where he had to check himself. Is that my motivation? Am I taking this position because of my love for others? And once he started praying about it, he realized that the reason he wanted the position was from the prestige of the position. Because people would, where his name would be. I mean, this is, this is common. This is something we all have to fight. And he said, and because of that, I had to turn that job down. He said, it would have provided me those three things. However, my motivation needs to be that it puts me in a position to love others better and more. And so that's another way to check. So the, the two questions that we can ask each other. Does what I'm being called fit into God's guide? There's three questions, sorry. Does what I'm being called to fit into God's guidelines for me? Does what I'm being called led to do lead me to more purity of heart, mind, and action? Is it helping me love others? Check my motivation. Check where I'm going with this, God. So the, Peter here, God, gives us direct instructions on how to kind of discern his voice. So once you've asked those questions, check, 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 then do it, right? Do it. How incredible would it be to walk on water, whatever your metaphorical water is going to do? Because if God gives you the vision, he's going to give you the provision. And you can count on that every single time. And when you decide to follow God's will, there is this peace. There is this courage. All of this comes upon you. And I know this because it's happened to me. God took this non-decision maker into somebody that was willing to follow his will no matter what it would take. And I'm like, oh, I'm not perfect at all. I mess it up and I, I fold back and I'm like, oh, really, really, God, I, I think that the weather's not right for that today. But just do it. But here, do not mistake peace for easy. Because <laughs> that's really easy to do. And so one of my kids was going through, they were really struggling with the call God had on their lives. And they said, Mom, Mom, if, if God called me to do this, he wouldn't have made it so hard. And, and, in my, and in my best loving mom voice, I looked at her and I said, what Bible are you reading? <laughs> like, seriously, God called people throughout all of scripture to do really hard, difficult things. Noah, I want you to build a boat in the desert. No, nobody's ever seen rain, but just go ahead and do it. Talk about the ridicule. Talk about a man with no friends now. 
Or Moses, I want you to go. I know it's your homeland. I know you know all these people, but I want you to go, and I want you to just go shift their whole economic dynamics. Tell them you're going to take all the slaves, everything that they depend on. You're just going to hot tail it out of there. I'll be with you. It would have been hard enough to go to a stranger, but to go to a friend was even more difficult. Esther, I want you to go to the king. And I know, I know that when you request a, a, an audience with the king, you very likely will be killed. But, but I want you to go to request an audience with the king because you're going to save your people. Jesus, I want you to be ridiculed. I want you to be spat on. I want all of your friends to desert you. And I want you to die for everyone. A death that you don't deserve. What God calls us to is hard. But I have to tell you, he gives you the power and the strength and the courage and the patience to do everything because you will be walking a miracle. And it is powerful. It is powerful to be walking that miracle. And it's something that we are all called to do. Absolutely every one of us is called. Ephesians 2.10 says this, you were created a masterpiece, God's workmanship, to do all that he, all the good that he has desired to do way before. Here, I'll read it. That's kind of my interpretation. So, um, Ephesians 2.10. Hmm, it's not here. You're going to have to go with my interpretation. Sorry about that. Oh, there it is. We are God's masterpiece created by his workmanship to do good things, which he prepared in advance for us to do. Because here's the other thing. He's going to work within our gifts. He's going to work within the way that he created us. He is going to work with our talents, with our passions. He is going to work alongside of that. Now, you will never, ever see me to be on the financial team. And those are the people that know me. Like my husband is dying back there. I do not have a concept of good money use at all. I just don't spend it or I spend it. Those, that's how I do it. <laughs> Nothing in between. And so you don't want me there. God will never call me to that. If, he, if God said, wake, if I wake up someday and I'd be like, God says, hey, I want you to be on the financial team. And I'm like, bah! who are you trying to torment today? It's not going to happen. God is going to work within my talents, with my gifts, with my abilities. And he created for purpose. We have been created on purpose for a purpose. We have been created on purpose for a purpose, and it's to follow the will of God. When we don't jump out of the boat of what that purpose is, we are always going to feel this discontent. Sometimes we choose to do the easier thing, and we'll feel it. I call it a holy discontent. Because there's this gap between my comfort level and where I think I want to be and where God is calling me to be. And in that gap, you are going to feel disconnected. You are going to feel discontented. And the minute you jump, you're going to feel purpose and joy and peace. So yeah, yeah, sometimes it's hard. But you, when you align your will to God's will, it makes all the difference in how you live your life. When, when we go on to verse 23 here, he says, For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. When we turn our lives and our wills over to God, we live for the eternal. We quit living for the things that we see and feel and, and experience right now. And we follow the will of God and what we see and experience and do and live like grows in living color. Um, 20 years ago, I can't believe it's been 20 years, we lived in St. Louis. We loved it, loved it. Um, it was amazing. Um, we had the best friends that we we still get together. Um, I, we just saw them. I, I did their daughter's wedding in, off, in um, that month after, in, after June, July. <laughs> Um, anyway, so we went and I did that. And so we are still so, so close to them. And, and we were like family there. I was close to my family. My mom and dad could come over for birthday parties and go home the same day. It was amazing. And then my husband starts feeling this holy discontent. And I'm going, I don't want a holy discontent. I don't want it. I don't feel it yet. And then I started, God, starting to move. And my husband was so unhappy. 
I said, I said, Paul, I said, here's, here's the thing. This is what we have to do. And this is God. I am not this smart. Okay, so let me just clear the air. I, I am not smart at all, but sometimes I try to follow the will of God. And, and he, I said, listen, we're going to have to make a decision here. We're either going to decide to be happy in the situation that we're in, or we're going to pray to God and see if he's asking us to move. And it was like a big weight had come off of him because we were so happy there. But he was so unhappy because... What, what looked like was happy, there was a discontent within his soul that we were not doing what we were supposed to do. Because see, when he finished residency, we liked St. Louis so much, we just decided to stay there. We didn't consult God. Because we liked it. We, we thought it was great. And so we decided we should stay there. And we were there for three years. Seven total. But three years struggling with what the will of God was. And so, I mean, it's a long, drawn-out story. I'm not going to go all there. We decided that um, he came home and he said, hey, there's an opportunity in Kentucky. I said, that wasn't on the list. <laughs> Sorry. And, and I, I don't mean, I, I love living here. Okay, so, so start here. Okay, I love everything about being here. But 20 years ago, I have to tell you, the news does not place Kentuckians in a good light. It does not. And so I'm like, why... I don't think that this is a thing. And Paul's like, it, it, I think it's a good opportunity. I think we need to check it out. I'm feeling this. And I'm like, all right, we're going to go. And the minute we came here, we knew. We knew that this is where God was calling us to do. We didn't know why. We didn't know anything else other than God was calling us to be right here. And so we had to. We packed all of our stuff. It was not easy. That's another story for another message. And... Um, I, my pastor there told me, he said, I want you to write down all of the things that God is calling you because when you question it, I want you to come back here and know the truth of what God has called you to do. Isn't that brilliant? When my feelings waver, come back to the truth. And so I cried, literally, it's seven hours. I cried all the way here. Not because I didn't want to come, but just because I was grieving the process. And uh, we get here and, and God, is, God has just been amazing. And then when we started Cross Point. I would have never been able to be a part of that. And it was hard. I think we put in 15-hour days on Sundays, and I loved every minute of it. I mean, people would work full-time all throughout the week, and then we'd put in 15-hour days because we believed so much that people needed to know the love of God. People that weren't already coming to church needed to know the love of God. And, and Augusta, I just speak to you for just a minute, because what you are doing is amazing. You have guests. Yes. You have given up comfort and you have started something new because you believe so much in your community. And you have jumped out of the boat to do whatever God wants to do there. But here's the thing. Once you jump out of the boat, there's other boats. What is God calling you to do? Augusta, what is God calling you to do now? Maysville, what is God calling you to do now? Because it doesn't end because the eternal kingdom, people coming to the eternal kingdom is too important. So when you're trying to discern the will of God, knowing that the will of God is going to take you from the temporary to the eternal, it's what we've been created to do, to be his workmanship. We have been created for a purpose, with a purpose. What is it that God is calling you to do? Is it to stay in a marriage? Is it to leave a relationship? Start a ministry? Get to know your neighbor? Show someone the love of God? Show someone the gospel of Christ and lead them to a relationship with Christ? Start a Bible study. Start a Bible study with unbelievers. Only you know what it is. But don't just jump out of the boat because you think it looks good. Lord, is this going to show purity of love, heart, action? Is this going to show your love to others? Is that where my motivation is? And if it's not, then help me surrender more of myself to you so that everything that I do shows your love. Because I want to stay within the will of God. 
Don't let me jump where you're not calling me. And don't let me hang back because I'm scared of what will happen. I got to hear a, um, a live interview with uh, Dr. Charles Stanley. And some of you may not know him, but he's probably one of the, the best preachers of our, besides Chad, of course, you know, one of our best preachers of, of today. And he's 80-some and still preaching every Sunday, 50 years. He's, he's celebrating 50 years today, actually, in his church. Um, but here's what he said. They said, what do you attribute your success, success to? Every, you know, what, what do you attribute to? He said, here it is. Obey God and leave all the consequences to him. Obey God. Leave all the consequences to him. I bet he said it 15 times. We started to laugh. But that's how he lived. I purify myself so I know what God is calling me to do, and I obey God. And then it doesn't matter what happens. I've obeyed God. There's no failure. There's no success. There's just living what God is calling you to live. Isn't that freeing? I love that. Obey God. Leave the consequences to him. Because how incredible is it going to be to walk on that water? Right? And we'll never do it if we stay in the boat or if we jump out of boat that we weren't called to jump out of. So what's your story? Where does it go from here? How do you feel God is calling you out of the boat? Have you asked the questions? Does it lead me closer to Christ? Does it purify my heart? Am I obeying him? Am I learning to love others through this? Lord, is it you? And then pray to be able to give what God is calling you to give. I'm going to give you just a few minutes right now. And I want, before I pray for you, I, know, I just want you to, to spend time, just a couple of minutes with God. Just say, God, what's my boat? Where have I been clinging to the side? <laughs> Where have I just jumped? hoping that you'd catch up with me. Lord, let me jump the direction that you are and help me to discern what direction that is. I want you to take just a couple of minutes and, and just pray to God about what your boat is. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you so much for, for who you are and the message that you give us. Lord, I'd ask that we be courageous enough to jump out of the boat that you're calling us to jump out of. Lord, that when you give us a direction, that you give us a plan that we can trust you enough because we know you. We can trust you because we've surrendered to you. We can trust you because we've obeyed you before. Lord, help us to be quiet enough in the storm to recognize your voice. That, Lord, that we know that whatever you are calling us to do, that you will make that way possible. Lord, I thank you. I ask all these things in your name. Amen. We invite you guys to stand and worship with us.
Can we just take a moment and thank Tammy for that amazing message today? She just, it, it always feels like she's talking directly to me. If you would like the opportunity to pray with someone about getting out of your boat or discerning calls, God's call in your life, we'll have members of our prayer team on either side of this stage. Please come back and join us next week. Chad will be back, and we will continue our series out of the boat. Have a great week.